live from Barcelona, Spain, it's theCUBE, covering Cisco Live Europe. Brought to you by Cisco and its ecosystem partners. Hello everyone, welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage in Barcelona for Cisco Live 2019. I'm John Furrier, co-host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante. Our next guest is Wendy Marsh, who's the president of Cisco EMEAR, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and Russia. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Great to be here. So one of the themes, themes this year certainly is cloud, data center coming together. But the other backdrop is, besides security and all of the things going on with data, is the global landscape. So Cisco, obviously North America, everyone knows what's going on there, Cisco Live. What's happening in Europe? Obviously GDPR has been hot in the past year. What's new, what's the scene like here? You know, I think that certainly the scene is one of huge excitement, you know, from our customers uh, across the whole region of Europe, Middle East, Africa, Russia. It's an incredibly diverse region. Um, but you know, if you look at the different countries, the different markets, one thing that absolutely is a constant theme that we hear is the desire and the appetite to gain the benefit from transformation, you know, and the digital transformation and what that value can be, and realizing that. And if we look for ours, you know, within, uh, within Cisco and the position around and realizing the secure intelligent platform is absolutely resonating. You know, so things like um, multi-cloud and realizing that, reinventing the network, the security challenge and dealing with that and how you address it with the multi-domain architecture approach. So our customers are really yeah. um, engaged in the conversation, want to learn more, but most importantly, want help with the how. Show me how to do it. You guys must be leading the uh, conversation within Cisco, obviously your team in Europe, Middle East and Africa and Russia, because the complexity around compliance and data has been front and center now for 24 months. Yes. And now hitting mainstream global landscape. Yep. This is really impacting the architecture. I mean, look at the how intent-based networking is developing, policy-based fill in the blank, to connecting to multiple clouds. Yep. So kind of complex, a whole new architecture, reimagining networking. How are you guys seeing the trends now? Is it still at the tipping point? Is it still early? What's your, what's your assessment of the, the role of data as it gets more complex, more compliant driven? So I think that it's certainly, if you look for organizations, the power of being able to understand and the importance of your data where it resides, being able to demonstrate that, having the integrity and the quality of that data is extremely important as well. So there's a heightened awareness in the market and for organizations global organizations who conduct business in EMEA, um, you know, of course, and we are one of those as well. So a knowledge and understanding and appreciation of compliance and regulation, it's only going to become more intense, you know, as we go forward. So for organizations to really have robust and rigorous processes around all of that, and technology can be an enabler in the process as well. What are the unique aspects, Wendy, in, in the region? Uh, you obviously have visibility in, on what goes on in North America. What's different in, in, in Europe, uh, especially in the context of cloud, multi-cloud, obviously GDPR, although it's a framework now for, 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 for everybody yep. around the world, but what's unique uh, in the region? So I think the uniqueness is, you know, if you look from a multi-cloud standpoint, for example, where you know, organizations are, have been, I, I would say, depending on some of the countries and markets, a little bit more hesitant around a movement to cloud. Mm. And now there is a movement, and, but it's more one of, well, what is appropriate for me and how do I ensure I can embrace multi-cloud in a way that makes sense for my business? So rather than a full move to public, there has been a selected, you know, based on um, application and workload environments and also understanding the security um, back to compliance and also um, the regulation impact of some of those movements as well. And of course that depends upon the vertical or the industry in which those organizations are operating. For, so for those who are highly regulated like healthcare, you know, the pharmaceutical sector, there's a deep inspect uh, that goes on there as well. So I think there's a further requirement for due diligence um, around some of those topics as well. Well, and the, you know, the Snowden backlash had some paranoia, for sure, with everybody said, oh, it's going to go to two or three clouds, and that's clearly not been the case. Yep. You have you know, many dozens and hundreds of service providers that are, that are specialists, uh, obviously, in, in the region. Um, so we heard today about uh, a, really an end-to-end -end architecture, mm -hmm. which is a, a bold and ambitious vision. You have a technical background as well. I wonder if you could just describe sort of how that's all going to transpire. How do you take the customers on their journey? 
What are they asking you for help with and, and where do you see it going? Yeah, so if you look at, you know, from David this morning, David Geckler mm. and what he talks about. Uh, so really, you know, for those different domains, there are competencies, you know, if you think. So there's the data center, there is the edge, uh, there is the security world, the collaboration world. So the reality of it is, though, that as, a, as an enterprise or any organization indeed consumes those things, they want to be able to work across all of those areas and they want the innovation to work in a seamless manner because at the end of the day, the problem to solve too is simplify for me. I need to automate, reduce complexity. I want to roll out and deploy policy in a consistent and cohesive way. So in order to make that happen, you have to have these environments it's able to talk to each other, but more importantly, push that policy in a cohesive manner across these environments. So for us, it's a journey. Um, so it's not something you can do overnight. You have to work within your engineering teams and your ecosystem in order to bring that to life and do it in a way where the customer can, consu can consume it. Hmm. I think you really nailed the, what we see in the trend as well, this cross-domain component with APIs now, which are open, are pushing data around, yep. so you're moving data from point A to point B, sounds like networking to me. Policy is yeah. important. But the configuration, the deployment, which used to be hard is now being automated. So the question I have for you, we're here in the DevNet zone. I mean, it's packed. People are learning about programming. What is the impact of all this to developers who are trying to build apps and your ecosystem? Because there's got to be an opportunity there. Some might go the way of the old guard and kind of fade away and some new kinds of providers might merge rise up. Yeah, you know there's huge opportunity here and I think it's opportunity around um, the requirement for new skills, new competencies, uh, but also around new capability to bring this to life. Because if you look from a development standpoint, if you look at how you realize value with organizations and where does the money flow uh, between some of these environments is interesting and the ecosystem itself, you know, for Cisco, what I, what I believe makes this even more powerful is bringing to life and, and accelerating with the ecosystem. Because at the end of the day, the customer will buy an ecosystem style environment. So for us to be able to work with with all of those parties as we have over many years, and there will be new players, the ISP community, the developer community that we work with that will be really powerful for so us as we ecosystem move. ecosystem growing significantly? Ecosystem growing? Absolutely, absolutely. What are some examples? I mean, just look at here. Yeah, look at the it. organizations that are here. Well, I think the development trends clearly intersecting with networking as yep. it's more programmable, right? Yep. I mean, that's the big takeaway for us. If you can program the network, you have infrastructure as code. That's the DevOps promise that's yep. now here. The question we're looking at is, okay, what's going to be the impact to value creation? So from a customer, what does it mean to me? So, the, so as we look at that, I tend to think about the, the Cisco original business model, enabling technology. Well, how would you answer that question of what's being enabled today? What's the big aha for customers? What are you guys enabling through your partners and your tech? Yeah, so I think a big part of it is we see now a lot of the conversation is around what is the use case. So it's not just a, I've got some cool stuff, show me the cool stuff that works, it's how do I apply that into my environment to derive value, and that value may be around efficiency, it may be around provisioning in a more rapid manner, automating in a more realized manner. Lots of different uh, instances where organizations can see the benefit associated with that, but also it allows them to free up time of their people and their teams to move into newer areas as well as they move their own business models. Because you know it's a massive transition that's happening in the industry overall. It's not just, we're not just changing for the sake of change, we're changing yeah. because the market is asking us to do that. Well, and so customers have to make bets on who their multi-cloud provider is going to yep. be, and obviously Cisco's coming at that from a position of networking strength, which is mm -hmm. a good place to come from, but there are other, there are alternatives. Sure. Because it's a big market, yep. and it's strategic. What gives you confidence that Cisco is the right solution? What are you telling your customers in that regard? So, I, you know, if I look at the, the, what gives me confidence is the fact that we have an openness. You know, if you look from, a, um, from an API standpoint, a developer standpoint, we've always operated in a mode of an openness so that you have an environment where anyone can write to. That's, people want that, it's incredibly important. So not having a proprietary stance is very powerful. But I think also being able to work with a ecosystem that's there where you have a dependency on others and you meet, with, you meet in the channel on certain solutions and innovations as well. So you empower a greater 
community to start to drive that acceleration with you mm. um, as well. And you know, and if I have a look at the, you know, we talk about reinventing the network, it's happening, it's happening mm. now, you see us doing it, and just yeah. how important the network is, more than ever before, in this transition, you know, around a number of areas with security, with policy, um, and it's, we're, I mean, we see it come to life now. Well, the old saying, the network is the computer, well, duh. <laughs> <laughs> Cisco's the network. Yep. I got to ask you about Brexit, as someone who's based in the UK, yep. um, thoughts on effects that that has? I mean, obviously, Cisco a global company, but your perspectives on Brexit. Yeah, so if I look for, you know, as someone who lives in the UK, you know, clearly we, we hear about Brexit a lot, mm. um, as, you, as you know, you, you do in, in your, your country as well. And I would say for us, we are very, you know, as Cisco is a global company, we're very, fam we're very familiar with working with these types of instances and situations. The UK remains for us an incredibly important market and will continue to be. And we'll, you know, we'll continue to invest from a capabilities and a skill standpoint. And I think just for us now, you know, working with our teams there and making sure that there's, um, we minimize any impacts based on scenarios you know, to our customers and our yeah. partners yeah, and rules, think it through. Rules change, you'll adapt. Um, yeah. I got to ask you about R, the the, the Russia piece. Uh -huh. Russia's uh, GDP is about the size of Spain, if, mm -hmm. uh, if I'm correct. Um, interesting that you you carved that out as a, as a as a distinct opportunity. How's the business going there? Maybe some comments around. Sure. Russia. So I can't talk directly about business performance as we're in quiet period, mm. but I guess we call it out specifically because it is not part of Europe, Middle East, or Africa, but is a very important part of our region of, mm. a, of Emir. And if I look for as of you know, we believe that there is significant opportunity for us um, in that market. We have a fantastic team mm -hmm. um, that uh, that work closely where there again with our customers and partners. And uh, you know we believe there's um, you know absolutely opportunity for us as Cisco in that market. You have a development team there as well, or, or we have it, yeah. um, we have capability there yeah. that works locally with all of our uh, all of our teams and you know engineering yeah. competence, sales teams, etc. As well, yeah. Some good good math. Wendy, how are Russia. you guys organized uh, in your territory? How do you guys maintain? close to the customer in the countries? Is it a country strategy? How, just for people who don't yeah, know your it's business. Yeah, it is a country strategy. So we have um, you know, a, a, about 123 countries within EMEA, um, and we have teams that live and operate in all of those countries um, that stay very close to us from a regional perspective. So we're one team you know, that really drives that uh, scale. I have a fantastic opportunity to go and visit those teams yeah. um, you know, and spend a lot of time on the road. And uh, you know, I enjoy it, and, and they do too. You know. Is there anything you could talk to your customers that are watching here, or anyone interested? As you guys have transformed as a company, certainly if you look at what Cisco's done over the past few years, a complete transformation, building on your base. You've been through it, you've been agile and getting yep. nimble and, yep. and being more use case driven, et cetera, et cetera. What have you learned? What's your learnings and what would you pay it forward in terms of advice? Yeah, so you know, if I if I look at it, we're not through, we're still, you know, <laughs> we're still on the journey. And I think a big part of it is accepting and acknowledging a need for change is really important. Um, but a big part of this change is culture. So if I look for us within Cisco and the culture of our teams, our people, and having an attitude and a style of a yeah. desire, a curiosity. Um, and a willingness for change is really, really important. And as we talk about the transformation topic, you need both. You know, technology is incredibly important and powerful, but you need a spirit and a culture in your yeah. people and your teams to want to drive that change with you. You need that culture, DNA, it starts at the top. Well, thank you for taking the time. Pleasure. Looking forward to following your progress as we take our Cube Global next couple of years. Looking forward to keeping an eye on what you guys are doing. Thanks for joining thank us. Thank you, great to this see you. This is theCUBE here live in Barcelona for Cisco Live 2019. We'll be back with more after this short break.